I'm Rabbi Steve Cohen of the Hillel Foundation at UCSB, and it's my honor to welcome you and to introduce this afternoon's program, which is entitled Survivors of Trauma, a panel discussion with Dr. Robert Krell. This is an event in the Herman P. and Sophia Taubman Foundation Endowed Symposia in Jewish Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara, which is co-sponsored by UCSB Arts and Lectures, the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center, the Department of Religious Studies, and Hillel. And I especially would like to thank Mr. Morris Squire for his support of the visit by Dr. Krell to our campus. Since today's event is being videotaped for broadcast on UCTV, I would ask that you please turn off your cell phones or other electronic devices. So let's all do that. <laughs> Make sure. So I'd like to take just a minute to explain the format of the program the, uh, this afternoon, and then I, I will introduce our speakers. <clears throat> um, Dr. Robert Krell is with us today. He is Professor Emeritus at the Department of Psychi Psychiatry at the University of British Columbia. And he will open the, our program with brief remarks on children who survived genocide, reflections of a child Holocaust survivor psychiatrist. And I'll tell you a little bit more about Dr. Krell's biography in just a minute. After Dr. Krell's opening remarks, each one of our distinguished panel, who I will also introduce in a minute, um, will be asked to make uh, relatively brief comments, just about five minutes each, uh, from the perspective of his or her own research or practice related to the general theme of survivors of trauma. Once each of the panelists has the opportunity to, to offer remarks, members of the audience will be asked to pose questions and offer comments directed at the panel. And our hope is that this program, our hope is that the program we have designed will place the specific trauma suffered by child Holocaust survivors in a broader context, as we believe that there is something to be learned from approaching this subject from a comparative perspective. So I, I'm going to give you a little bit of, of um, biography on each of our panelists just before each one of them speaks, rather than going through the the, um, the whole long list of um, biographies all at once. So first I'd like to introduce our, our keynote speaker, Dr. Robert Krell. Dr. Robert Krell survived the Holocaust as a hidden child in Holland. He became a noted child psychiatrist, recognized in particular for his scholarly research and public lectures on the psychological trauma suffered by Holocaust survivors and their children. He co-authored an updated, translated edition of, oh, I'm going to have to make a stab at this name, Judith Hemendinger Feist's book, The Children of Buchenwald, Child Survivors and Their Post-War Lives, which recounts the story of the 426 young survivors sent from Buchenwald to France. Professor Emeritus, Department of Psychiatry, University of British Columbia. Dr. Krell lectures widely throughout the United States and Canada. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Krell. I welcome the opportunity to share some observations on the lifelong struggle forced upon Jewish children who survived the massive genocidal assault known as the Holocaust, or in Hebrew, the Shoah. My hope is that we can learn from our attempts to recover from the massive psychological trauma and achieve a measure of normality, and that such knowledge would assist in dealing with the massive trauma still visited upon children through genocide and other brutalities. Who could have imagined that after the world witnessed the Nazi carnage, new regimes would engage in similar genocidal atrocities, which by definition are visited upon innocent children. Genocide demands the murder of children. 
I was born in The Hague, Holland, to Jewish parents. Holland was already occupied by the Germans who were daily issuing edicts designed to restrict the lives of Dutch Jews. In August of 1942, we received papers for resettlement to the east, that mysterious resettlement that later was found out to be Auschwitz and Sobibor. We were to report on August 19, 1942. I was given to a Christian family at age two, and my parents went into hiding separately. We made it. Over 80% of Dutch Jews did not. The vast majority were murdered in those places I mentioned, Auschwitz and Sobibor. Of 108,000 Dutch Jews deported, 3,500 returned. At liberation in 1945, at age five, I did not even know I was a Jew. In fact, my first post-war year of school at a Catholic kindergarten made me into quite a devout Catholic. The highlight of my stay with the wonderful Dutch Christians who sheltered me had been to help decorate the Christmas tree. No, I did not know I was a Jew, nor was I fully aware of the persecutions, but I knew throughout my hiding that I was in grave danger. I became a silent, compliant child who never complained or cried. Not until liberation did I cry or protest, and that was largely over having to leave my parents to be returned to my real parents, who had become to me strangers. I did not yet know that one and a half million Jewish children and adolescents had been murdered during the first five years of my life, and that the slaughter had coined the ominous word genocide. Throughout the course of human history, there have been enormous slaughters. None to that time had been the explicit policy of a nation state using every available technology to implement its single-minded goal of annihilating an entire people. From every Nazi-occupied country of Europe, the Jewish citizens of Holland and France, Germany and Poland, Czechoslovakia and Hungary were collected, forcibly transported, and brutally murdered. It was an unprecedented industry of robber, robbery and of murder. The 1,712 Jews of Rhodes were taken from their island home of 1,500 years. And when Germany was losing the war, the murder of the Hungarian Jewish community actually intensified in ferocity. The war was in its final stages. Germany was losing, but the killing of Jews remained the priority. Fewer than 5,000 European Jewish children survived concentration camps, a mere handful. Comparatively more survived in hiding in homes, barns, convents, monasteries, forests, and caves. In Nazi-occupied countries, 93% of Jewish children were murdered. Counting those children who were spirited out of Berlin, Vienna, and Prague just before the war, perhaps about one in 10 survived. What has happened to these children? Is there anything to learn from their struggle to recover, to heal, to live a normal, decent life? What has happened to their pain, their wounds, their memories? What has happened to their trust in people, their faith in God, their optimism for the future, for themselves, for their children, for your children? Yes, for your children. The Holocaust or Shoah is not a problem exclusive to Jews. Sadly enough, we were merely its unfortunate victims. However, the Shoah remains a staggering problem for the world's major religions, whose congregants and constituents were amongst the perpetrators. The Holocaust is a defining moment in human history, for it occurred not only after the Age of Enlightenment, but in modern times. And it originated in an enlightened and culturally sophisticated society. Students the world over scrambled to be educated in Germany, for Germany's universities were prized above all. Germany's reputation in literature and music, medicine and law, architecture and engineering was the envy of all. But Germany lost its soul, and it did not take long. The perversion of the law took only three years, and of medicine, six years. The regime installed in 1933 introduced its racial laws in 1936 and instituted medical killing by 1939. Survivors found in concentration camps in 1945 
and who survived liberation expressed a single idealistic notion that whoever would see what had been done would ensure that such things will never happen again, ever, anywhere, to anyone. On April 5th, 2001, I attended and participated in a Rwandan community commemorative service, the first to be held in my city, Vancouver. A young Tutsi woman addressed perhaps 150 people. It was the first time she had spoken of what she had witnessed. From her hiding place, she had seen the first visit by a Hutu killing squad. She described that they did not simply kill. They hacked off the legs of their victims, returned the next day to hack off the arms of those still alive, and returned once again to finish their gruesome task the next day. That is how her family died. It took three days. Who can even imagine such things? Perhaps only the victims who suffered and died, only the witnesses who suffered and lived. And their suffering is without end until their own deaths. This is one of the issues we must address. How does one live alongside death, so palpable, so intimate? Have Holocaust survivors learned something about this which may help new generations of victims, particularly child victims, deal with their sorrow, with their grief? Elie Wiesel, the survivor of Auschwitz and Buchenwald, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, speaks eloquently of this problem of living with death. I paraphrase his comments. He recalls that upon his liberation, he and other children and teenagers were asked how could they be helped to cope with life. He says, it was easy to adapt to life. It was difficult to adapt to death. We became used to death. It was an everyday event. We were surrounded with corpses. We slept with the dead. What we needed was help to adapt to death, to regain our respect for death, ordinary death. My father lost his parents, two sisters, and a dozen close friends during the war. He had lost his son for three years, perhaps for good. He was 32 years old. Did my father have trouble adapting to life? Not that I could see. He went to work again. Within a few years, he owned the first store, had a wealthy clientele, his own car, motorcycle, and a home. He embraced life. But at the same time, death embraced him. Everywhere we went in The Hague, there were reminders of who was missing. He stared at the windows of his former home, the empty synagogue, the apartments in which his friends had lived. Death was everywhere. He developed a disdain for death. My father refused to enter a Jewish cemetery for the remainder of his life, with one exception, the unveiling of a Holocaust memorial bearing the engraved names of his murdered family, and mostly he went because I had organized the building of that memorial. Is it possible to recover from too much death, an overdose of death? Perhaps not. Genocide is marked not only by brutality, but also by the indifference and arrogance of the killer. It leaves a survivor different from those who survive an ordinary death. A Holocaust survivor or survivors of the Khmer Rouge or from Rwanda, they are so frequently alone, the sole surviving members of entire families. I suppose that the child survivors of genocide are destined to live life differently, not only because life's course has been mutilated, but so has the concept of death. And in the shadow of such events, how does one adjust to the memories and the nightmares? When I first began therapeutic work with Holocaust survivor families and former Dutch prisoners of Japanese concentration camps, it became rapidly clear that their basic struggle was one of memory. Some complained of too little memory and were trying to recapture events, and others suffered with too much memory and its daily torment. I have had patients beg me to relieve them of those memories and nightmares. Such a request raises a complicated problem. If the memory is particularly painful, such as the separation from one's mother, 
The image of her face is nevertheless precious and connected to a wish not to forget. Should one try to reduce the impact of the trauma if the price paid is to forget the kindness of her look, the tears in her eyes? Over the years, I've been continually impressed with the astonishing ability of the majority of survivors to live a life full, filled with achievement, love of their children, loyalty to their community, and the capacity somehow not to hate. Many commented on their ability to compartmentalize their wartime traumas and separate their grief and pain from the ordinary course of their working life. The challenge to the living is how to survive having survived. I'll discuss briefly three themes that may be helpful in the never-ending efforts to heal oneself and perhaps others, remembrance, education, and justice. With respect to remembrance, it may sound peculiar to insist that we remember what we think we would most like to forget. But we must not forget. Murdering memory is the ultimate objective of the genocidal killer, a second genocide. The enemies who persecute innocent children wish to murder twice, first our families, then our memories of them. Why? Because the erasure of memory absolves the killers and it enables them, or others, to kill again. When Hitler was challenged as to his plans to murder Europe's Jews, he replied, who remembers the Armenians? Had memories of an earlier slaughter awakened the conscience of good people, the nature and extent of the Holocaust might have been different. But there was little notable opposition to the master plan. Holocaust survivors have shown the path to memory and its power by refusing to forget their tenacity has caused some world leaders to intervene in actual and potential genocides. Not nearly enough has been done. The successes have been modest, and yet Canada opened its doors to Cambodian boat people in part because it had earlier closed its doors on European Jews. Canada's parliamentarians were reminded of that. The terrible wars in the former Yugoslavia were at least monitored closely and the gruesome killing of civilians constantly exposed so that the killers were hampered in their efforts. Even without direct intervention, would Auschwitz have been as efficient had there been television cameras or journalists nearby? In order to preserve memory, it is imperative that audiovisual testimonies are produced. The power of personal testimony may inspire children to turn away from violence towards more peaceful pursuits. The offering of testimony is surely a cathartic undertaking for a survivor of any kind and ensures that the story is made available and preserved. In turn, the personal experience provides knowledge that may affect the listener sufficiently to refuse participation in acts of atrocity and torture. It is easy to speak of mass death, but the story of one person can make a difference. That is why Anne Frank's diary resonates with youngsters who can comprehend the murder of a million and a half children, but we, cannot, we, but we can connect our feelings with the murder of one child, particularly one so spirited, so readily identified with other children. However, we must remember that good teaching requires accuracy and honesty. Anne Frank's diary addresses her life, not her horrific death. While she remains alive and with hope, she writes her opinion that human beings are still basically good at heart. Her statements of optimism precede her family's deportation to Auschwitz, the death marches and transports to Bergen-Belsen, and the starvation and typhoid which killed her mother, sister, and finally herself. What might she have written about humanity's goodness had she survived? The power of testimony is undeniable. At the United Nations Conference Against Racism held in Durban, South Africa a few years ago, the agenda was shamefully hijacked for the political purpose of smearing Israel and the United States. By all accounts, the one shining light within the program were the indelible impressions left on some delegates by those who offered personal eyewitness testimony of present day torture and enslavement. Slavery is alive and well, for example, in the Sudan 
the Dinkas who comprise Christians and tribal faiths are captured and marched to the north by their Muslim captors. A group called the American Anti-Slavery Group noted that the Swiss-based human rights group Christian Solidarity International purchased the freedom of slaves. Since 1995, they have freed 54,000 people. An estimated 200,000 women and children remain captive in northern Sudan. Of 51 freed women interviewed, almost all had been raped, and one in six endured genital mutilation. A report in Canada's National Post newspaper some years ago reports that revolutionary United Front rebels have freed 107 children, mostly girls, who were used as sex slaves in northern Sierra Leone. Humanitarian efforts are initiated on the basis of received knowledge. One has to know of suffering in order to respond to it. Children who survived the Holocaust and child survivors of more recent acts of war and slavery possess that knowledge. Sadly, they know. And their heart-rending stories reveal to us what transpired with the millions who cannot speak, those who were forever silenced. Violence against children has become mainstream, no longer a marginal or incidental activity. The murders of little children, the enslavement of children, the recruitment of children in order to teach them to hate and to kill, these are a central component in the political strategies of many nations. In the modern world of the last century, we witnessed the killing of children as a deliberate policy of nation states. War is bad enough, but there was a time when war was confined to battles between soldiers. Women and children and the elderly were not always the primary targets. Not until those boundaries were unalterably violated. Even Sigmund Freud, spirited to safety from Vienna to London in 1939, felt that his four elderly sisters would be safe. Who would arm the elderly? All four sisters over age 80 died in concentration camps. The unbelievable became believable, and the impossible was indeed possible. We must add that knowledge to our deliberations. The pursuit of justice provides a measure of healing to the injured and aggrieved. Justice is pursued primarily in a court of law. Nazi war crimes trials established precedents for the contemporary war crimes trials taking place in The Hague, the city of my birth. How ironic. There was precious little justice meted out to Nazi war criminals, most of whom lived out their lives in relative comfort and safety in North and South America and in the many countries of Europe where they had plied their murderous trade. And yet we have learned not to give up pursuit in response to the nonsense regarding the perpetrator's exemplary neighborly behavior and their advanced age and fragile condition. They participated in an orgy of killing and torture. Who would respond to the discovery, even 50 years later, of the murderer of one's brother or sister with the plea for them to be released without trial? Some years ago, I assisted a survivor of modest means to fill out compensation forms. It took us several years of correspondence to fulfill all the requests of the German bureaucracy and finally success. He was sent a check for $1,300. I was devastated. Having received the copy, I called him and I offered my apologies. $1,300 for the loss of his entire family, including eight brothers and sisters four years of slave labor in mines, and this money for enduring and barely surviving a death march. He weighed 68 pounds of liberation. To my surprise, he was ecstatic. He said, the first time I applied several years ago, they questioned the dates, my memory, my judgment. They all but called me a liar. Now they accepted my eyewitness account and they have acknowledged the injustice committed. I feel fantastic. It was for him a great victory and signaled a vast improvement in his emotional health. Remembrance, education, justice. Each has served in some small measure the efforts of the Holocaust child survivor struggle to carve out a niche in life that most of us would consider normal. And the process of remembering the attempts to teach about the experience and the efforts to obtain a measure of justice all have contributed to healing a trauma 
that cannot ever be totally healed. We must listen carefully to survivors of trauma in order to construct a healing response. We must learn from them. Thank you. Dr. Kill, I know I speak for everyone here in thanking you for those profound and moving comments. Thank you very much. Okay, now we turn to our guest panelists. <clears throat> and we'll begin, I think, with Professor Susan Derwin. You're first on my list, Susan. Okay. So. <clears throat> are you, oh, is that okay? I, sure. I just wanted to make sure that, are you comfortable I, to go first? Okay, great. Um, Professor Derwin uh, teaches in the Department of Germanic, Slavic, and Semitic Studies and Comparative Literature Program here at UCSB. She has written a psychoanalytic study of the realist novel, The Ambivalence of Form, Lukash, Freud, and the Novel, and is currently working on a book about representations of the Holocaust in film, literature, and museums. Um, okay. Um, would you like to come to the podium and speak from here, or are you uh, I'd more stay comfortable here there? If, if, I, if I could. Of course. Um, well, thank you very much, Dr. Krill. I mean, I, I found your remarks just um, thought-provoking, so I'm talking and thinking at the same time. Um, but I guess uh, my first response is that what I find as somebody who teaches Holocaust testimonies and Holocaust literature, what I find so crucial um, pedagogically is something that you both mentioned or discussed, but also demonstrated. Namely, um, <clears throat> the telling of a testimony or the telling of a life story or part of a life story is um, the story of an experience that takes place over time and that really brings to life um, and into specificity, into specific focus, statistical information and history. And I think, so, so that something that I find to be crucial about testimony is the way in which it vivifies history to students in the same time, and this is sort of the second part of my thinking about this, that it can also make it more problematic. Because the more one does, I find, um, study individual stories, the less one can feel that the kind of tripartite structure you outlined, remembrance, education, education and justice, always really delivers fully. So that, if you know what I mean, so that um, one can read somebody like Primo Levi and read a, read the testimony of somebody who has struggled with um, what he calls an instinct more powerful than the need to eat even, that is the need to tell the story, and marvel at the way he is able to create a narrative with shape and unity and that's sort of predicated on reason and the the faith that the telling of the story will both impart the knowledge and also relieve him of this need that he's feeling. And one can read that and at the same time one is left with questions about the way certain experiences can't make it into narrative. The way certain pains and I mean for example, or perhaps the kind of pain that is associated with living next to death or living with death, as you say. And so one is left with questions about um, what is excluded, what can't be spoken, and what the pressure of the unspoken is upon not only the narrative, but the life that someone like Levy and you know many others have constructed afterwards. So. I'm not sure if I can sum up what I've said, only that, that the more one learns, the more, and perhaps this is the point of, of reading, the more 
questions open and vistas open and knowledge becomes in a sense less affirmative and um, I mean there is a there is a, a an affirmative and, in a sense, very optimistic and and um, uh, sense to what you've say what you've said when you've said things like, um, and I, and I I believe this as well that memories of earlier slaughter can awaken the conscience of those in the present to other threats. So there is still a kind of faith in the appeal to conscience. And you you also said that one hopes that audiovisual testimonies are, may inspire children to turn away from violence. And so I mean I, I agree with that. At the same time, you also said, and again, I'm sort of pointing out another tension in, in sort of that might be a parallel to what I see in the literature. You said that today violence against children has become mainstream. Well, that's right. So there's sort of double truths that, that writing and narrative and testimony and bearing witness and reading testimony can bring one into greater sensitivity and awareness, and at the same time can bring one possibly into areas that seem uh, more menacing and more troubling and more difficult to digest, if that's even the right word or process. So maybe you could respond or. Um, yeah, Dr. Bell, I'd like to give you the option of, of either responding or just waiting to, to, to hear the rest of the comments and then. Perhaps I'll make a little bit. Fine. Okay. Next on my list is Barry Specks, Department of English, UCSB, a poet and novelist who served as professor of humanities at MIT from 1960 to 1981, and now teaches most frequently in the College of Creative Studies here at UCSB. Thank you, really. I think I'm most uh, interested in trying to say a bit about what can't be spoken, picking up from your phrase. Uh, I believe I was invited to the panel uh, as a Jew, as a Buddhist, <coughs> and as a poet. And beyond the feelings and concerns that obviously what Dr. Crow has told us stir in all of us, uh, I relate to his presentation, uh, as many I think will, Jewish or not, who were protected, nurtured children. I was a protected, nurtured child during World War II and only gradually became conscious of the Shoah as a disaster of disasters. Um, I'm referring to a sort of reflected trauma that might put us in mind of the effects on temperament and lifestyle that could emerge in children of our moment, conscious of genocides and state and religious-sponsored terror, such as Dr. Krell has mentioned. Uh, a somewhat cynical or paranoid set toward life, a pervasive fearfulness on the one hand. Life is a dangerous nexus of dangers to be manipulated or dealt with by accepting forms of marginalization or inner exile, avoidance, anger, rage, or in a healthier adaptation to be overcome by eager participation, striving. What Dr. Krell noted yesterday uh, at the Bronfman Center as the survivor's hunger for normal life. We often encounter a deep silence here, also in such indirect witnesses to horror, the lucky exceptions. How would their shaping experience even be mentioned in the face of the immediate suffering of the hidden, the murdered, the bereft, who endured? As a senior student of Nyingmapa Tibetan Buddhism, I believe that the rather startling number of Jews, certainly in this country, who have been attracted to Buddhist thought. Some estimate that as many as one-third of those taking up Buddhist practices in recent years identify themselves also as Jews, that these practitioners profit from Buddhism's study and training of mind. Through a near endless multiplicity of practices and exercises, Buddhism gives hope of transforming trauma-associated patterns of compulsive desires, anger, hope, and fear into more peaceful, helpful, habitual states of being. Such promised changes of habits of functioning reach to the very core, compassion triumphant over victimization and rage. In our very degrees of harm, 
We are all to some extent victims of the horror century whose legacy we must hope to transform. As Jews, as Dr. Crow reminded us yesterday, we are forbidden to despair. We are forced to hope. Finally, as a poet, and perhaps this will resonate with the experience of some of you, I see everywhere in my own work the, silence, the silent witness of the Shoah. My most often anthologized poem is entitled Finding a Yiddish Paper on the Riverside Line, and it attacks the speaker, in effect, for not knowing enough Yiddish and Hebrew, not knowing these languages better, these holy letters like dark candelabras that loom for him like strangers in the living room. Such strangers are more than letters, they are the ghosts of the dispossessed. Again, as a poet uh, and a literature professor for these many years, I wish mainly to offer thanks to Dr. Krell for the intensity and eloquence of the way he bears witness. He breaks the silence. We are all, in a sense, survivors, charged never to forget. Thank you very much. Next, we will hear from Angela Mazur, who is the student and campaign coordinator for Amnesty International at UCLA, is what, is that, that's what I have here, who has served as a volunteer for the past five years for the Global Children's Organization, which nurtures children traumatized by intolerance, terrorism, or war by providing summer camps and ongoing programs which prepare both children and volunteers to be active participants in building a peaceful world. Angela? Thank you. Um, I can speak from my experience as a volunteer in Bosnia. I've spent the past five summers there volunteering with children who were in, endured the civil war there during the early 1990s and the kids come from Croatia, Serbia and Bosnia representing the different ethnic and religious backgrounds and come together for two weeks to experience each other, play and form friendships. Um, the first time I went there I was 17 years old. I came from Salt Lake City, Utah and I had no concept of what had happened in that part of the world to my peers which is who I was volunteering with and the level of ignorance in America that I felt so ashamed by having had coming there and realizing that while I was in junior high school they were dodging sniper fire to get water, had no electricity in their homes in Sarajevo. This was a city that hosted the Olympics in 1984 to go to 1990, 91, 92, literally a completely surrounded city under siege, not to mention in other parts of the country such as eastern Bosnia where there was ethnic cleansing going on. Um, friends of mine who were living in villages had to escape into refugee camps at age five, six, seven years old were brought to Tuzla. Their fathers had to stay and fight in the hills. They with their mothers, you know, these are young mothers, little children, flee into a bigger city in Bosnia, then to Slovenia, then to Italy, then to Switzerland, now living in America. They're our age and have lived in so many different places. Their life has been disrupted so many times. And for me, I just, I couldn't even handle how privileged my life had been in contrast to what they had experienced. And yet, here we were together, ready to volunteer and create this camp for children for two weeks. And in that process, in hearing what they had gone through, even just very minimal amounts, as um, Dr. Krell was saying, there's a need to tell, but what I also found was that they didn't want to talk about it as much as maybe I would have expected. They want to go on and live a normal life and not be identified as having endured such horrendous things, which literally we can't understand. There was times when they just say, you know, you can't understand this, and this is the bottom line. Like, there is no way that I can ever understand what it felt like to run through those streets. And now when I walk through the streets of their city and I see the bullet holes in the wall or you see the shelled buildings, it kind of takes me back. But I really don't understand what it was like when that was fully enraged. So to really both hear what they want to share and learn as much as I can, but also really respect that not having endured it, you 
have a different position, but sorry, this also is kind of incoherent because I'm <laughs> thinking <fine>. about <laughs> what you said. Um, there's sort of two things. One is definitely understanding, we do learn a lot about the Holocaust, in, particularly in America, but we don't learn about the Armenian genocide, what happened to the Bosnians, what happened in Rwanda. Too many young people today don't understand that this thought of never again, which was what they said after the Holocaust, has happened again and is continuing to happen. And so there are generations now growing up that have endured this yet again. And how can we kind of as young people unite to bring that awareness forward so that what they endured in 1995, you know, they're my friend's fathers who were living in a town called Srebrenica, which is in eastern Bosnia in the mountains, over 8,000 men and boys were just lined up and massacred. 8,000 is the conservative number. My friends from there say it's far more than that are missing. But this was happening in the 1990s, and we didn't stop it. Europe knew, America knew. So it's really that I think they feel so angry that in this day of globalization with all the media, which is so important, it still continues. And as it was happening in Bosnia, it was happening in Rwanda simultaneously. It's just the degree to which it continues and we can still be so protected from it here and really not have it affect our daily lives is scary and maybe it's kind of why it can continue. Um, and so that is definitely to learn and to hear what they have to say and speak their voice here if they can't be here. I went back to my community in Salt Lake City and was showing slides and trying to just bring that information to the public, which is the first step. But the other thing that I also think is really important is this camp is about bringing the kids of the different backgrounds together. So we had Serbian kids there who, in the American media, the Serbs were the perpetrators, the evil ones who were committing these heinous atrocities. Yet there's seven-year-old boys, one's name is Slobodan, one's name is Muhammad, they're in the same room now and they are going to interact for the next two weeks. If we come with this projection that he's the bad one and Muhammad the Muslim is the good one, then automatically you're putting them on different planes. But the perpetrators have an enormous sense of collective guilt, whether or not they had any role in the genocide. I think a lot of us understand your government is perpetrating something in your name that you may be completely against. So, so many Serbian young people, their government was undertaking this ethnic cleansing, yet it completely was against everything they believed in, but you're a seven, eight, or even a 15-year-old kid, what can you do? How can you stop this? So, I think to also realize the trauma on the perpetrator and that the future is the perpetrators and the victims are still living together in Rwanda, the Hutus and the Tutsis need to live side by side. So also that we need to hear the victim's story, it's crucial, but also to hear that of the perpetrators, or not even the perpetrators, but those that are collectively associated as the perpetrators. It's an enormous burden that they bear, especially going as they become leaders in their society. So that is something, that's sort of my thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. Please. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. I want to comment now because I'm not smart enough to remember <laughs> five people's remarks. So if I may, uh, Angela, thank God for you. Um, I mean, people like you are the forefront of our hope and the possibilities. Um, I, I totally... Uh, take to heart your remarks about the fact that they don't want to speak much now, but they want to be asked. After the Holocaust, no one was asked. When they spontaneously offered some of what happened to them, they were told to keep quiet and get on with life. Now that would be okay if that was just Oh, the ordinary mainstream adults who were trying to help children along, but it was the mental health professionals who did that to them, who came from a generation of learning uh, that said, talk about everything. Let's hear everything. Let's understand everything. And the, the, suddenly the mental health professionals had new rules for those who were so severely traumatized. You know why? They were afraid to hear. And this is, what ha this is what has happened in the field of the therapies. The reason 
that trauma survivors, generally speaking, haven't gotten good care for so many years is because the therapists are afraid to hear what they have to say. And they may bear the brunt of that first emergence of the rage that the victim feels. So when you speak of silence, it becomes a very complicated matter. And Susan referred to the things that cannot be spoken. I know of no survivor, certainly no Holocaust survivor, and certainly no Dutch survivor of Japanese concentration camps who tells me everything. I'm aware of that. And they do fairly well in my presence because they assume that being a survivor and having thought about it and written some, that they can tell me, and they still say things like, there are some things I cannot speak, and I know what they are doing. You know what they're doing? They're protecting me. They're protecting me. They don't want me to know what they carry. Barry, you're a lucky guy. You, you cover all bases. My God, if you live in fear, you can be a Buddhist if you, you know, a poet. You know, the, the one thing that came to my mind as you spoke um, was when Elie Wiesel said uh, there was a time when a rifle was more powerful than a thousand poets. And I've struggled with that, that notion because the killers killed our intellectuals, our poets, our creative people, everything that they, that they could have been. And, uh, and it is true, we haven't learned yet somehow the notion uh, I value poetry, I value testimony, I value writing and novels, I value respect for language. Uh, but there are still killers who make no distinction between what people are capable of. They just kill. Uh, so my mind is racing with your thoughts. I'd like to ask now Carol Tenenbaum to take her turn. Carol is a psychoanalyst. She holds a doctorate in clinical psychology and is an associate member of the Los Angeles Institute and Society for Psychoanalytic Studies in Los Angeles, where she chairs the Trauma Center Project. She is also the art director for the board of the Global Children's Organization and has worked as their, at their summer program in Croatia with children who have been traumatized by the war in the Balkans. So this must be the same organization that Angela was... Okay, so uh, Carol. Um, Dr. Krell, I want to thank you very, very much um, because I think that you speak for all the children and you break the silence because the children cannot always speak for themselves and I'm indebted to you very much and I think we all are indebted to you for keeping the dialogue, keeping, keeping the importance of the children alive because you're right they suffer in silence, and this has been my experience, until someone asks them, until someone wants to listen. And you make a very good point about the therapeutic community, because um, it's hard to listen. As a therapist, I've worked, well, let me just tell you a little bit about my own experience. I've been a therapist for 25 years. I've worked with people who are survivors of many traumas and violence and abuse. And um, in 1996, uh, my husband and my daughter and I went to Bosnia to work in this summer program. And I remember that first summer there. We were all scared. We were all very scared. We didn't know what to expect. The children got off the bus. They looked very frail, they looked very fragile, and they looked very frightened, but more than anything else, they looked very old. They looked very worn. 
And so we took it upon ourselves. I think there were maybe 30 of us American volunteers, all ages, to just be there with them for two weeks. And I think in my own anxiety, I had brought crayons and papers and paints, and I set up a little space. I didn't speak the same language that these children spoke, so how was I going to be able to communicate with them? But I set up the paints and the crayons, and the kids came, and they came every day. And they painted, and they drew, and they played. And we didn't need a common language other than the language of love, and the language of art, and the language of being together. And as a therapist, I realized the it wasn't the theories, it's not the theories, it's not the all these years of study, it was just a matter of being there. And so when we left Bosnia that year, I said to myself, well, this is now a commitment that if we are really going to do any good, we have to come back. We have to come back year after year after year. We cannot walk out on them. We cannot do what many other NGOs do. They go in for three weeks and never come back. And so we've been going there for eight years now. And Angela and I talk about this a lot, you know. Are we doing any good? Does it matter that we're there? I don't know. I really don't know. Things there are very, very desperate. Things there are very, very bad. Um, but I do feel that, especially for the older children, that we've been there for them, they have one good memory amongst all this horror. They know someone out there cares, and someone out there will speak for them. And I think that that matters. Um, so I just want to thank you and to validate and hope that you will continue your work. Thank you, Carol. Our final panelist this afternoon is uh, Elizabeth Faber of the Department of Germanic, Slavic, and Semitic Studies here at UCSB. Her research interests and publications include French philosophy and theory, psychoanalysis and trauma studies, German Judaism of the 19th and 20th centuries, and she is currently working on a project on meditating on the Shoah, which you heard earlier is the Hebrew word for the Holocaust, meditating on the Shoah where philosophy and psychoanalysis meet. Elizabeth. Thank you. Well, first of all, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Krell from the bottom of my heart for uh, what he shared with us. And I would like to um, come back to a few points you have mentioned. Um, uh, first of all, I think what you have done today, um, it reminded me really very much of a sentence which Susan and I read together yesterday in our class by Toni Morrison, who in a short text called The Side of Memory says, um, facts can exist without human intelligence, truth cannot. And uh, the way in which we have discussed this in the class we, are, we, we have been teaching together is that truth cannot uh, exist without this dimension of human intelligence that is called testimony. You know, that someone has to witness to a truth for it to be a truth. And I, and I think it's, um, I think, uh, you know, uh, and listening uh, to you uh, today made me really think of that. Um, you mentioned that uh, producing testimony is one of the three pillars from, you know, on which uh, perhaps a different world could be built, and um, because the story of one person makes it possible to connect to this gigantic, massive trauma, and uh, you know, one by one, we need to explore these stories, at least when they are 
when they are offered and encourage um, them to be told and heard. And um, since um, Leonard Warlock and Richard Hecht asked us to also you know, contribute a little bit of our teaching and research expertise, um, I find it very, I want to mention that I find it very interesting that in contemporary continental thought, the concepts of persecution, witnessing, and childhood are very, very central. So uh, that contemporary, especially French contemporary thought, um, has been preoccupied in the last 40 to 50 years by rethinking um, what witnessing entails and what the vulnerability of childhood ent entails. And I'm personally, I'm convinced that those thinkers who go down that path would not have done this without the historical experience of the Shoah. I think there's a very deep connection to uh, that historical experience. Um, and uh, and uh, perhaps one other, uh, one other very central element of uh, French contemporary thought is the question of the address. And I cannot help but think that here too, um, the historical experience of the Shoah has triggered this questioning precisely because the reason why children are so utterly vulnerable is that they are still in the process of being formed emotionally, phys physiologically, of course, psychologically. And we all know that children do not thrive when they are not addressed, when they cannot turn to someone who you know, welcomes them, welcomes their story, but calls them their name. And uh, the fact that those children, in one of your texts you mentioned that some survivors of the camps did not remember their names anymore. Because they, nobody called them. And this in the, in the formative years, right? Uh, I mean, of course it was devastating for the adults too, but I think uh, the reason why the experience of children is so, um, so utterly hor horrific is that, you know, the very, the very, um, the very mechanisms through which they mature I mean, aside from food and drink, of course, but you know the the uh, the fact that they could not turn to anyone um, or appeal to anyone. I mean, that's a, that's a huge trauma, and so um, uh, because as I mean, we have also read in this class one text by a child survivor and uh, psychoanalyst Dory Laub who has this sentence that without the address, if you cannot say you to another, you cannot say you to yourself. And uh, of course that inflicts an um, unimaginably deep wound on any child. And I think that's why uh, uh, you know, addressing the experience of the Shoah through um, childhood survivors is something where we really get to the, I mean, a terribly, you know, the core of the wound. So thank you very much for offering this testimony that you are giving us. Thank you, Elizabeth. Very, very much. I, I'm sure that I'm sure everyone would agree that we've already had a, uh, a wonderfully, wonderfully rich exchange. Um, just before I open it up, though, to, uh, to your comments and questions, um, Dr. Krell, would you like to make any response to uh, Elizabeth or, or, or Carol? Yeah. Well, I'll be very brief because uh, obviously, we want your participation, your questions, what, what has come to your minds when you hear us speak of these things. But I, I just want to make, make these comments. What you, uh, what you have mentioned, Elizabeth, is really uh, 
just a, a phenomenal perspective. Um, the, the meaning uh, to children of affirmation of their identity. Uh, it reminds me of, of my friend who I mentioned yesterday in a talk, Robbie Weisman, who was a child in Buchenwald, and when he came out, could not respond to his name. He says, after, after years of being called by my number, which rolls off his tongue still today, um, I could not imagine uh, that someone would address me as a person. And in, in my... Uh, in, in my short discussions in this book about, uh, about the children of Buchenwald, I mention they had hundreds of pictures taken after the war. So I comment on that. These American GIs and others took pictures of them and they all got copies. And a lot of the Buchenwald boys, that, uh, and I, by the way, I mentioned boys, there were no women in Buchenwald, there were no girls in Buchenwald. So it was only men. And the boys came out and I wrote in my discussion a commentary about the photos, the photographs, and that I thought they were being taken to reaffirm themselves, who they were. And you see them in these photographs grow from these thin, undernourished, malnourished, skeletal beings into healthy, robust boys. And until they began to get photographs of themselves, think in Buchenwald, do you think they had mirrors for themselves? They had not seen themselves for three or four years. And that is what it required, a name and a visual identification of oneself. Really quite an incredible thing when you think about it. You mentioned so many other important things. And Carol, your work in Bosnia, is it worth it? I now know it's being taped, so I hesitate to say this, but my father watched my efforts in Holocaust education and I built a memorial. Then I founded a Holocaust education center, and we teach 25,000 children a year now uh, through our efforts. And he says I was pissing in the ocean. Um, that was my father, the realist, who uh, could not have disdain for death and a few other things. Uh, but piss we must. We don't know. We don't know. Which of the memoirs, the memories, or our efforts takes hold in life? We just don't know, but they must be out there. We must be out there. All I can tell you about the symposium we have offered to a thousand high school students specifically that we bring out to our university every year now, it will be the 28th year. Students who attended as 16, 17-year-olds a decade or two ago are now bringing their own classes there because they had one day of Holocaust education. We take that as affirmative feedback. Uh, so some were touched enough to bring a class of 40 children year after year after year, and none who have come. Those, some of those teachers who have been coming for 20, 25 years, I say, why do you come back? Why do you bring your class back? Or why, if you bring them back, why don't you go to the cafeteria and have a coffee? They say, because we have never left here without learning. If there's any message about the Shoah, is that it is a vast, unfortunate, but vast treasure of learning. And I, I want to tell the students here, I want to urge you to fight against the resistance that you may hear from your elders. Too much Holocaust. Holocaust is not unique. There's so many other genocides. Well, you know, we don't want it to be unique. We never wanted it at all. But the fact of its uniqueness makes it possible to generalize to these other tragedies and genocides and to learn from them. Don't let anyone convince you of Holocaust fatigue. We've had too much of it. We've had far too little. We've had far too little. It's, it's, it's learning potential has barely been tapped. So uh, thank you for for your remarks, and uh, if you have the koya, the strength to keep going there, and to have people like Angela at your side, and perhaps some others, 
who I'm sure after hearing today will want to ask you how to do this. Keep going. Would any members of the panel like to just add a comment or two before we go on? Yeah, Angela, go ahead. Just one thing that came to my mind, which is some, one of the first things my peers that I met at the camp said to me was, don't think that this can't happen in your society. And that was like something I never had thought of. Like, of course that can't happen in America. But really, they were living at a in an interactive, multicultural society just like ours. And they said to me, imagine, you know, the KKK controlling all of the media and all of the print and you becoming so brainwashed and so scared. This type of a thing could happen in America. And as much as I have faith that it will never, we need to keep that in mind. And that is why we do need to learn so that we can look so critically at our own society and ensure that those kind of roots of that extreme hatred which will ultimately lead to a genocide don't begin to take shape and we've seen in the backlash of 9-11 the type of underlying hatred that exists on so many levels and really can be so easily manipulated through fear so I think that that's why it universalizes it for us. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else on the panel? Yes, okay. Um, You've all been very patient, and I'm sure that you've found it worthwhile. Um, I'd like to invite your questions and comments, and in the spirit of sharing names with each other, I would like to ask you to, you know, if you do have a question or a comment, um, let us know who you are as well. So, yes. Okay, yeah, and that came across in their art and architecture. Uh -huh. Hi, I'm Drew, and um, the question was this. First, I liked your speech, well spoken. Um, you mentioned that you're really upset about your friend getting $1,300, I believe, uh, to pay him off for his slave la labor. Am I right on that one? Thir $1,300, yeah? He, he was my patient. Your patient, okay. A very okay. depressed Holocaust survivor who had, who had suffered and wanted to kill himself. Uh, and part of his therapy was us sitting together to apply for restitution and that's what we got thirteen hundred dollars okay right. do you believe that which upset me do you think that um sort of restitution should be applied into other cases as well like what do you think about reparations what do you think about victims of other wars and uh yeah, the restitution from the aggressive side to a non-aggressive side, and things like that. Yeah, well, I, I hope I told the story correctly. The, the point of it was that I had missed the point. Uh, I thought it was about money, and it wasn't. Restitution for him was about recognition that he had been victimized. And for him, it didn't matter, although he was a poor man, it didn't matter to him whether it was $1,300 or $25,000. With respect to the entire issue of redress and, uh, and restitution in Canada, uh, every interned Japanese person during the Second World War, you probably know, this happened in America too, uh, was given $21,000 Canadian. I doubt that that made a difference in their lives after what was stolen from them when they were interned. Uh, but again, it was a matter of justice. It, it, offered a degree of healing and a degree of closure. So where applicable, where someone has been done a grave injustice, I am for restitution, but perhaps not in the amount of money so much as the acknowledgement of what was done wrong. Does anybody else have a, a comment or a question that they would like to offer? or ask. Yes, I know your name, Fred. My name is Fred Tannenbaum, and I want to thank you, Dr. Krill, for clarifying some of the, or identifying the process of education, remembrance, and justice, because I think of my own experience. I, too, have gone to the camp in the former Balkans, or the former Yugoslavia in the Balkans, and in the middle 1990s, I would read about Bosnia, and I'd see numbers, but I could not identify and did not realize 
the extent of what was happening. Until we heard speak the founder of Global Children's Organization, and she talked about the plight of the children. And right away I started to remember the Holocaust. And never again. And I said, I can't believe this is happening again in the middle of Europe in the 1990s. And as I got more involved in Global Children, I started to read about what was happening there. And there was a book published, not Anne Frank's diary, but a book called Zlata's Diary. Zlata was a young child living in Sarajevo during the um, siege of Sarajevo, which went on for close to four years, uh, which in fact is the longest modern siege of any city. And all she kept repeating in that book is, does anybody care? And to hear this from a child. And it was because of those two things, the remembrance of the Holocaust and the story of the individual child that I think really drove me to get involved and, and to participate in, in the camp. Um, but I hadn't realized the process. As to your third point, justice, um, I certainly understand that. I am an attorney and certainly believe in it. But in talking to the young people who we have worked with who, uh, from the Balkans, most have not wanted to see criminal justice uh, prevail. Uh, there are some more crime trials going on now in The Hague. Many of them have told me they're not that interested. They just want to move on. Uh, very few have said that it would make a difference if certain people were arrested or certain people were tried. Um, so I'm not sure if how, how that uh, feeling of justice, um, whether it does affect many of the young people or not. Um, but certainly the other two points you made are critical, remembrance and education and knowledge of the individuals. Hearing numbers of 7,000 killed or 8,000 is a horrible number, but it is so overwhelming that for me, I can't, I can't identify with it. It's out of my experience. But to hear an individual story certainly makes it real and tragic. So I appreciate your, your involvement and in your, in your talking to us today. And I'd like to thank, thank the rest of the panel. I think it's been very informative. Thank you. Anybody else? I will uh, I will introduce our <coughs> distinguished Nobel laureate Walter Cohn. Walter Cohn. Uh, <coughs> on the subject of of justice, um, a, a very prominent name is uh, Wiesenthal, and uh, uh, he's a landsman of mine from Austria, and I've not met him, but I've thought about him a great deal inconclusively, and um, I would appreciate your thoughts about me and uh, I, I, uh, I feel I'm dominating the panel. That wasn't my intent. Uh, <laughs> um, but, my thoughts about justice, in the first instance, uh, when I heard you speak, um, I thought to myself, well, they just haven't got there yet. The survivors upon liberation, you know, American soldiers handed them their rifles and said, we'll turn away for 15, 20 minutes. The British too. And survivors didn't go on a killing rampage, even though they were filled with rage and had been treated outrageously. Jews did not turn into killers. Uh, and they wanted to get on with life, just like these children. I think, I cannot be sure, I think there will come a time where they have succeeded to go to school and become an attorney like you and rethink 
that issue because we're speaking with 60 years behind us now. 60 years of these developments and their developments as, as victims of something outrageous is in its infancy comparatively. Uh, and I think there may come a time when they want to. They want a measure of justice. How, what form it will take uh, is a question. For survivors, it has been, generally speaking, not one of vengeance, but one of, one of justice in, in the broader sense, recognition of their victimhood and, uh, uh, and uh, the attentiveness of people to finally hear their stories when they became ready to tell, when they became ready to tell. Simon Wiesenthal, of course, is a, a powerful name in, in, uh, in survivor issues. Uh, his pursuit of Nazi war criminals really was, uh, was relentless. And it was also, I think, entirely uh, with the objective of seeking justice. I don't think he was a man of vengeance of any kind. And uh, I think you can see that very clearly in the book that he wrote, uh, The Sunflower. Uh, have you, by any chance, seen that book? Um, in, it, in it, he describes how one day when he was walking with a battalion of slave laborers, he was whisked away from going from his concentration camp to his work, slave labor work, because there was a dying soldier in a hospital, I think swathed, covered in bandages, and, uh, and he, he needed a Jewish survivor to whom to express his guilt and be forgiven. so that he could make it into heaven, clear as a bell. Um, and of course, uh, Wiesenthal said, uh, I cannot uh, forgive you because you and me don't have that connection that you have done something. You know, he, does, he didn't know how many Jews this man had killed, but only they, had one of them lived, could forgive him. But what is interesting about the book is that it ends up with commentary from about 20 really well-known persons. Perhaps you know them. I, I'm not sure I'm telling the story quite right, but, but uh, of what they would have done or what they imagined they might have done with respect to forgiving. So it's pretty interesting to see the commentary of a priest, you know, minister, a rabbi, an author, an intellect of one kind or another, an artist, a poet. So you have a chance on time to pick up that book. It's really quite remarkable on the issue of, of justice, and forgiveness, and what is possible that we, we are allowed to do in behalf uh, of others. I, I, I noted, uh, heard that I, I was speaking in behalf of children, and I guess in, in a way I do, although I don't feel that I can speak for the children, I can speak for myself. If it clarifies perhaps something of what other children think, then that's terrific. But I only talk about what I could clarify myself. All right. I have, I have a question that I'd like to, to pose. Um, it actually uh, stems from comments that uh, several of you made about the um, the risks involved in testimony, um, and both the, f the fears that a, um, a, a victim feels that you know you can't understand. You know I don't want to talk about it because you won't be able to understand, perhaps, um, or or the fear that the therapist um, feels of the you know of being the the one to bear the brunt of the rage, uh, and. Um, it actually, in some ways, goes back to to uh, Susan's first comments about the questions that testimony can can leave unanswered, and um, I'm I'm wondering, I guess, Dr. Krell, this is addressed to you. Although I'd be interested in anybody's comments, um, have you had experiences where, as a therapist, you have felt 
um, that it that it failed. <laughs> you know that the attempt to to talk, that the attempt to communicate broke down, and um, that you had regrets or that the person had regrets about having tried to communicate because it didn't work. <clears throat> it's a wonderful question. Wonderful question. I, I totally d distinguish th therapies from, th if, if I may, <laughs> the routine and the survivors. For example, I reveal nearly nothing to patients who I think should know nothing about myself. Uh, it is entirely uh, an issue for them to reveal themselves to themselves in the traditional sense of dynamic psychotherapy, perhaps. Survivors generally come to me knowing an awful lot about me. That's why they come. So I share with them. It happens sometimes I cry with them. We look at maps together. I don't do that with my patients, other patients. With my survivors, I say, where are you from? And they say, eh, little place in Poland. I haul out my map, show me. Where, you know, where were you taken? Where did you go to? Are they, I mean, this is the first time that anyone has asked them and they trace the map and the stories come out. And, you know, I mean, this is unorthodox. <laughs> this is not traditional therapy. And there are pieces of history uh, of which they have no idea. They don't just have no memory, they just have no idea. And I go through my vast library, which I have, I seldom read Holocaust books, but I have a huge library that I could consult. And I say, well, this is your village and this is what happened to them. Were you perhaps part of this group? But they say, yeah. I would, so it, I'll do anything, anything to assist them to talk. Now, if that's therapeutic in the sense of healing of some kind, filling in a gap of memory, of a gap of an experience, um, then that's good. If it occasionally is terrible, like traumatic beyond belief because they had rather not recall that particular event or incident, uh, I have not had the experience that a week or so later when they reappear or a month, some, some of it is so intense I don't see some people more than once a month. Uh, they come back and it's been healing because the moment of the trauma was the moment of that discovery of that particular memory. You never know what comes out. There are a lot of things they tell that they hadn't expected to. And, uh, and those, are t those are gruesome moments. And, uh, but over, over the long haul, over the long haul, it becomes part of their narrative, which they integrate. So, you know, I don't know what is the measure of success exactly. I, uh, the, my, my greatest measure of success is that uh, I'm always so grateful to them how much I learn from them that I sure as hell don't think I'm doing anything for them. I suspect you are. I'd like to address that too. Um, there's something called the trauma after the trauma. And very often it is how one holds or takes in or responds to a patient's very painful experience. And it's sometimes very possible that this happens, that you, there's a re-traumatization that goes on. Um, I'm working in the inner city right now, and I'm working with a um, population of people who have, um, are living in inner city violence and abuse and poverty and deprivation. And I go down to the Echo Park area of Los Angeles every week and work with people who would never be able to come to my office, my private practice. And I'm doing sort of psychoanalytically informed work with them. And I, like Dr. Krell, I have to completely alter the whole 
the whole um, the whole environment. I mean, it is. I work in a church. I, there's church stuff all over. There's. It's a room where the you can't keep the window closed, so it's freezing cold. People come, and I, mean, I have to do things that I would never think about doing in another in another circumstance. And yet, they come and they tell their stories, and I'm there, and I feel I'm a facilitating, holding, containing human being for them. And somehow or another, it may bring up terrible feelings. There's always the issue of the people's not having been able to ever regulate their emotional lives. It could be very traumatic, but there's something in me that says, come back and we'll work it through and we'll talk about it and we'll, we'll find a way to help you to repair. And that's all we have.